What is up, friends? Welcome on into PixWise Playbook, the divisional round weekend edition presented by our friends at Superbook Sports. That's Jared Smith. That's Tank Williams. I'm Lauren Jabara. And then there were eight, my friends. Eight teams left, seven total games left in the 22-23 NFL season. Tank, how are we feeling after Wild Card Weekend? Uh, feeling pretty good. I would say that I think okay. we've been spot on talking about the parody in NFL throughout the season. I think that showed its head, I mean, from the beginning of the wild card weekend all the way through with Seattle playing so close, a depleted Miami Dolphins team playing Buffalo all the way to the wire. I think the only game that was really mm -hmm. a surprise to me is the way that the Dallas Cowboys manhandled the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Yes. I expected Tom Brady and that offense to show up in this game and for them to just get dominated by the Dallas Cowboys. Cowboys the very start I would say that was surprising to me but other than that I mean I was impressed by the games that we saw this weekend and after Sunday in it I said that this was likely the best wild card weekend I had ever seen and then Dallas and Tampa Bay occurred. <laughs> and then Dallas and Tampa Bay <laughs> happened, and the second half of the Seahawks and 49ers game happened but truly Tom <laughs> Brady did not look like Tom Brady at all and Dak Prescott channeled like his inner football god or something. He looked phenomenal. Their defense gave Tom Brady no time. He was under pressure truly the entire game, Jared. What was your biggest surprise um, from wildcard weekend? Now there's eight teams left. I think the Jags winning, but then again, the Chargers are going, right? Tank, there's literally a verb that was invented for that team. Yeah. Um, they charge and then the subsequent... Yeah, literally. They, 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 that was, if you looked up charging in the dictionary, they would show you a replay of that I mean, game. Exactly. <laughs> That's the exactly. ultimate definition right there. We've had some yeah, bad yeah, moments yeah. throughout the years, but that right yeah. there encapsulates yeah. it to the fullest. Oh, my goodness. And I'll, th I'll throw it back to Tank on this. Were you surprised at all? I was a little bit. They didn't fire Brandon Staley. They fired the OC. They fired, I think, a couple of other offensive assistants. But Brandon Staley, despite the Mike Williams disaster – despite blowing that lead, seem to have survived the mayhem. Yeah, I, it seems like the players really backed him. You hear Herbert come out and support him. You hear Austin okay. Eckler say that. What do you want to look for in the coach and say, hey, you want the coach to win double-digit wins, get you into the playoffs, give you a chance, and if you're going to go out and hire someone else, they'll probably be looking to do the same thing. So why do you want to recreate the wheel from there? But – I think it is a little bit surprising because I think he's made some egregious mistakes throughout the regular season of the past couple of years. And then Love I've that it to this point to where you should have won this game easily when you get up by that much and somehow, some way, you find a way to charge in and lose that game. So I think management, they took a look at it for sure. But I think probably cooler yeah. heads survived. And then they said, okay, we're going to make some changes on offense because – when you look at the defense play well, he has the defense. The way they would turn over Jacksonville yeah. in the first half, you should just run yeah. away with that game. But then to get away from the run and not be able to execute in those situational moments late in the game in order to win the game, yeah. it was easy to kind of pinpoint on the offense. And I think that's what happened. Absolutely. It's crazy. To be honest with you, I thought Brandon Saylor was going to be the next coach. Out of there, canned, yeah. gone. He's going to be back. Yeah. We'll see what the Chargers are able to do this season. But we're moving on from them this year. Goodbye to the Chargers in the 22-23 season. Hello to the Jacksonville Jaguars. And that's actually the first game that we're going to be talking about. Before we do, NFL season betting stats. The unders, 150 in 123 this season. The unders are hitting at a 54.9% rate this season. I'm sorry to both of you guys who bet the over in that Cowboys-Bucks game. I faded you both and took the under just to, like, see – Maybe if it would hit. No, but truly, I thought the defenses would not allow very many points. And I told Tank, I told Jared this, too. I said, him, Jared, and Brett Mayer, Mayer Maher, however you say his last name, both got their yips out of the way in the wild card weekend. Now right. we move into the divisional round. Yeah, right. And we're coming back stronger than ever because we're leaving our yips last weekend in the wild card weekend. We're moving on. We're going to be the best that we've ever been this weekend. Jared, I, I have a feeling you're going to go 12-0 this weekend. I'm just putting it out there. I'm not going to make 12 bets you know, this weekend. That's for damn sure. Um, <laughs> I hope hey, I go. <laughs> no, let's say, let's cap it at like a five, five to seven range, right? I'm okay. going to go seven and oh. You're going to go five and oh, 
six and L or seven and L. How does that sound? We'll make that happen. We're manifesting. That sounds this yeah, yeah uh, for sure, for sure. Jared's going to be amazing against the spread. You want to know what other teams are really good against the spread this season, including the playoffs. The Giants are 14 and four ATS. The Bengals 12 and five, and the 49ers 12 and six. The Bucks. Now that we're done with them for this season. We're the worst team in the NFL this year against the spread, 4-12-1. And, and the Chiefs, who are still in it right now, also one of the worst teams in the league against the spread this year. The Chiefs are 6-10-1 ATS. Now, before we get into that Jags-Chiefs game, can Burrow, the Bengals, get a win in Buffalo? Can the Jaguars compete with the Chiefs? Is the third time the charm for the Giants? against the Eagles. Now, are you guys ready to run through a wall? I feel like I just set that up so well. Let's get right into the Coach divisional Jamara. round matchups. Yeah, yeah, LJ Smart, LJ Smart, Chandler Kirby. Let's, Let's go. go. LJ Smart. <laughs> we're taking it, oh, he, <laughs> we're did you wait, it did, out to air. Did you see game that pregame speech? One. You did. Oh, I listened yeah. to it. I listened yeah, to it. Yeah, I'm ready to go today. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Let's it go, baby. It was so good. Let's go. Um, all right, first game. There's four of them to get into. Number one on Saturday, we have the Jags taking on the Chiefs going into Arrowhead. The spread right now, the Chiefs are laying eight and a half. That total is set at 52 and a half. And man, what a wild card weekend, right? The number one seed, Kansas City Chiefs hosting the number four seed, Jacksonville Jaguars. They played back in week 10. Kansas City came out on top um, 27 to 17. Now Jacksonville is bringing the momentum from the third largest postseason comeback victory in NFL history. 27-point deficit. They came back, won against the Chargers. And not even Trevor Lawrence's four first-half turnovers could stop their momentum. They are now on a six-game winning streak. They've won seven of their last eight since losing to Kansas City back in Week 10. Now, the Chiefs, they won five straight to end the regular season. They've also won 10 of their last 11 after losing to the Bills in week six. They're the favorites right now to win the Super Bowl, and rightly so. They have six straight wins against the Jacksonville Jaguars in the all-time series. So they definitely have the Jags numbers. And Tank, you know this. KC finished the year with the league's best offense with total yards and points scored. And they ranked just outside the top 10 in yards allowed on the defensive side. Eight and a half is a lot, though. We've seen they have not been able to cover the spread when it's like more than a touchdown or a lot of these double digit spreads that they've been having all season long. I feel like Jacksonville could play them close. What is your expectation for this one? Uh, I feel the same way you do. All right, let's get a couple of things out of the way first. I'm not exactly sure where this total opened, but I saw it at 51 and a half and immediately my visceral reaction was over. And now we see it at 52, now it's at 53. So I think that, I think anyone who saw that, they're pretty spot on on that. And for a couple of reasons. I mean, we'll talk about the Kansas City offense whenever we need to, but we already understand what that is. Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, he has a bunch of weapons to throw it to in the pass game. The running backs mm -hmm. are effective in the run and pass games. I mean, so that offense, it is what it is. And we don't really worry about Jackson, about uh, Jacksonville putting up enough resistance to kind of hold them down. And so really when you want to mm -hmm. look at it, you say, what is that Kansas City defense going to present? And I think the interesting ways to look at that is the two games that they played against the Denver Broncos, where I think they scored 21 in one game, 24 in the other. Russell Wilson accounted for three touchdowns in each game. In one game, he had three passing touchdowns. In another, he had one passing touchdown, two rushing touchdowns. We can see Trevor Lawrence putting up similar results. Is that correct? And then also, so you in Texas, where I believe in that game where they pushed in the overtime, they scored 24 points. And that was one thing yeah. where the Kansas City Chiefs were always allowing teams who I felt were inferior to them, allowing them to just hang around late into the games and then find a way to win, whether it's like the last half of the fourth quarter and overtime. So when you look at it from that perspective and the way that they performed against the spread, it tells you that minus eight and a half is likely too many points. So if you want to bet on Jacksonville plus eight and a half, I'm not mad at that, but we also know that Kansas City, they compile on points in a hurry. The way that that Seattle-San Francisco mm -hmm. game played out, where San Francisco pulled away late in the game, you can see Kansas City doing that too. So that's where that, that gets a little dangerous. So if you want to lean anywhere on this one, I would say the over. But this Jacksonville Jaguars, like the narrative to me is pretty intriguing. I'm going to throw it over to Jared after this because the way they started off this playoffs being the wild card team, the number four team, the number four seed. Yeah. 
reminds me of Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals last year mm-hmm. when they pulled off the win against the Raiders. Then you go and you face a number one seed. I mean, obviously, the Kansas City Chiefs are built way differently than Tennessee, but they can pull off a similar string of victories and somehow sneak their way into the Super Bowl, especially the way Kansas City has been playing at key moments in this season where they haven't been the dominant team that would just put their opponent away. Thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Jared, I look at this one too, and eight and a half is a lot of points. Jacksonville's five and one against the spread in their last six games. You look at their schedule. Yeah, they haven't necessarily played the best defenses. They've been averaging just under 30 points per game during the six game win streak. The one thing that worries me about the Kansas City Chiefs right now um, is their red zone defense. They're allowing a touchdown scored on 67% of trips to their red zone, which is 31st in the NFL. Only the Colts were worse this season. So when you're holding team or when you're not holding teams to field goals, touchdowns, it's hard to cover a spread, especially when it's as much as eight and a half. How do you see this game playing out? And do you kind of think that Jacksonville maybe could have the backdoor cover? Yeah, I, I do think that could be the vibe here. Um, there's a couple of things that are interesting. First, let's start big picture. The trend you will Mm -hmm. hear a lot this week is Andy Reid off the bye. You will hear that probably more (laughs) from the mainstream media, maybe us included, um, than most other trends this week. And it's fair. He's 21 and three off the bye, eight and one in the Mahomes era, but just five and four against the spread. And they've actually failed to cover in their last two playoff games off the bye the divisional round against Cleveland um, when they did have a lead and then Mahomes got hurt and then you mm-hmm. know, Cleveland kind of came back and made it close. They won by five, didn't cover the spread. And in the Super Bowl against the Bucs when obviously uh, that game was not close by any stretch of the imagination. So there are some holes to be poked in the Andy Reid off a of by, you know, trend that you're going to hear a lot this week. So let's just move that to the side because I think it has absolutely no bearing on this game. I think the thing that does have a bearing on this game is that first matchup. The Chiefs won by 10. They covered despite the fact that they had three fewer possessions than the Jags, Kansas City turned it over twice, and they recovered an onside kick, wow. a surprise onside kick. So I think Mahomes is going to have a lot of success in this game. He threw for over 300 yards. Kansas City had, again, 486 total yards with three fewer possessions than Jacksonville in that game. To cover the spread when you're a mi- basically a minus three turnover, two turnovers, mm-hmm. and then the onside kick, you basically lost three possessions. So I, I think... Kansas City is going to have a lot of success moving the ball in this game. But I also think the Jags are as well. I think the one specific angle, really, really micro level I like in this game is Travis Kelsey. Jags are 32nd mm-hmm. in DVOA against tight ends this year. They really struggled to defend Gerald Everett last week. Seven targets, six catches, 109 yards, and a touchdown. And oh, by the way, when you get to the playoffs, Travis Kelsey is, as Tank likes to say, that dude. I mean, the numbers yeah. for Kelsey in the playoffs are absurd. He's had at least seven targets and at least 95 yards in six straight postseason games. He has scored a touchdown in five of the last six postseason games. The only one he didn't score a touchdown in was that absurd blowout to the Bucs in the Super Bowl when nobody on the Chiefs scored a touchdown. So I think the Jaguars, not only does the matchup tell me Travis Kelsey is going to have a big game, Travis Kelsey's postseason stats and how much Patrick Mahomes relies on him tells me Kelsey's the guy to bet here on the Chiefs side. The spread's mm-hmm. probably fair. I can see the Jags covering in the first half and then tailing off late and Kansas City gets in into that high gear. I'm not very interested in laying eight and a half points in a playoff game. The Chiefs are just 10 and 18 against the spread when the uh, spread is over a touchdown. So the Mahomes tax is expensive. I think the best angle in this game is points, the over. You've lost a little value now that it's moved to 53. Or Travis Kelsey, receptions, Mm -hmm. yards, touchdowns, however you want to play it. I think Travis Kelsey, to me, is the one betting angle in this game I really like. I will say, Tank, to back your over, the over is 4-0 in the Jags' four games. Last four games, first teams with a winning record. So they do play well and up their offense against teams with a winning record. Guys, this is still Patrick Mahomes' world, and we are just living in it. I mean, the dude's the league leader in passing yards at 52-50. Leading league leader in touchdown tosses at 41. League leader in total QBR, 77. And I know, Jared, you mentioned Travis Kelsey's numbers in the postseason. I mean, in the regular season, too, he's third in the NFL in receptions, eighth (laughs) in receiving yards, second and in touchdowns i mean this dude is the real deal and he's a tight end you know what i mean like he's not even a wide receiver like they're they use him all the freaking time i think this game plays out over 
Chiefs win, Jags cover because the Chiefs are one seven and one ATS in their last nine yeah. home games. So something to also keep like in it. mind when they're such a favorite by such a big spread. I'm interested to see how the Eagles are going to play the Giants this week. I love the Giants last week, and I especially freaking love Daniel Jones. Tank, I don't know if you felt the same way. I know we all said, like, their rushing game last week, we're like, well, they need to take advantage of the rushing game, really take advantage of the Vikings in the trenches, blah, blah, blah. Their passing game was phenomenal. And the fact that Daniel Jones was the team's leading rusher this past week, I mean, he played his best game in his entire career. They played yeah. a perfect game at this point. Like, I don't necessarily know if they're going to show up again and play a perfect game like that against a team like the Philadelphia Eagles. The Giants are getting seven and a half points in this game. That total is set at 48 and a half. It's ticked up a little bit. Is Jalen Hurts going to be 100%? We saw him play in week 18. He was still dealing with that shoulder injury that's kind of affected his play a little bit. And head coach Nick Sirianni said he still expects it to be a little bit of an issue in the divisional round. He's still going to play. Will he be 100%? I don't know. Is Daniel Jones going to play the same caliber of play that we saw last week against the Vikings? I don't know. How do you see this game playing out? Wow. There's a lot to talk about in this game. Uh, I mean, do we get to, do we get to talk about what happened against the Minnesota Vikings at least a little bit yes. because that yes, of course was crazy. I mean, obviously, I had a feeling that Daniel Jones was going to play well against the Vi against mm -hmm. the Vikings, but what he did with his legs along with his arm was just incredible to me. Like for the Vikings defense to be so inept and just not be able to prevent him from doing anything that he wanted to do throughout the entire game was just yeah. like crazy to me just crazy like i couldn't believe it um and i think the vikings earned my man a lot of money that being said the test he has this week against the philadelphia eagles defense is going to be an entirely mm -hmm. different animal entirely um so i don't really expect I mean, look, so this is the way I want to look at it. This is a divisional game, NFC East against NFC East. We know that they like to play each other close, but the Eagles are the superior team to me. And I feel that this could yeah. be a game that plays out similar to the 49ers and the Seahawks, where it's close through the majority of the game. And then the better team pulls away at the end. And for a number of mm -hmm. reasons, like the one thing that you want to be a little bit hesitant on the Philadelphia Eagles is this. Jalen Hurts was injured. You have Lane Johnson coming back for some injuries. So a lot of the momentum that they built on, like from the beginning of the season, the middle of the season, they lost some of that going into the back half of the season. And you want to know what are they going to look like after a bye week in the playoffs coming against a team in the New York Giants that seemed like they could be one of the hottest teams in the playoffs right now. But – Let's use the Giants as an example. They sat Daniel Jones. They sat Saquon Barkley and a whole bunch of other guys, and they came out with their hair mm -hmm. on fire against the Minnesota Vikings. So if the Philadelphia Eagles stars do the same thing coming off a of bye, then it should be a bloodbath because I have no worries about the Eagles running the ball against the Giants. They may not have the success that they had early on in the season, but I think they should be able to run mm -hmm. the ball pretty effectively. And if that run game gets going, we have to worry about stopping Miles Sanders. You have to worry about Jalen Hurts legs because they're now going to run Jalen again because it's the playoffs. They're trying to get to the ship now. So they're going to use his legs as well. And when you get so focused on trying to stop the run, oh, then what do you have to contend with? You have A.J. Brown on one side. You have Devontae Smith on the other side. And let's not mm -hmm. forget, we saw what T.J. Hawkinson did to that defense two times, the, the two times they played him this year. Yeah. Dallas Goddard can replicate that with the Eagles because yeah. he's that type of dude in their in their offensive scheme as well. So when I look at everything that – all the challenges that the Eagles present to the Giants' defense, and then on top of that, this is going to be one of the most formidable defenses that the Giants' offense will face. And now it's playoff time mm -hmm. too. I think it's going to be a hard test for the Giants to try to do what they did against the Minnesota Vikings. That being said, with the total being at 48, it seems like that looks about right to me. Um, when mm -hmm. you look at the seven and a half, I think the Eagles could end up pulling away at the end. So right now, I don't want to touch anything on this game, at least right now. But I feel like the Eagles yeah. are the better team and that they still come away with the victory. So you want to just do money line and do money line. But that's all I got <laughs> for you right now. Yeah. J Jared, I, I want to pose a point because the last two times that Jalen Hurts has played the Giants, 
he didn't have to deal with both DB, Xavier McKinney, and Adderay Jackson, right? They didn't play. They were back against Minnesota. They limited Kirk Cousins. They limited Justin Jefferson. I could maybe see that happening a little bit with Jalen Hurts just because he still is dealing with that nagging injury. He might not be 100%. But then you also look at the Eagles defense, and they held Daniel Jones to 169 passing yards in their Week 14 game. I know that was like on a, on a stretch where the Giants went 0-3-1, and I think it was, and they've been playing a little bit better since then. But they still have a league-leading average of only 178, basically, passing yards per game given up to opponents. So I feel like the Giants' run game and Saquon Barkley is going to be a huge key to success for the Giants in this one, taking advantage of really the Eagles, I guess, only weak spot that they have on their team. Yeah, um, the Giants' offense was unbelievable last week. I, I don't so even good. know how else to frame it. I saw a number here that I was trying to pull up um, during it, and I, f I just found it. So they had a 100% series conversion rate. Basically, that just means picking up at least one first down. Every wow. drive that they started, every single drive that they started the drive with a pass, they picked up at least one first down. They didn't have a three and out. Every single time they started a drive with a pass, they had a 68% success rate on early down dropbacks, the highest of any team on Walkard weekend, obviously. But to put that in perspective, Seattle and Kansas City led the NFL in the er – remember, we, we talked about early downs. They're a little more predictive than third downs, which are more volatile. So when I look at early down success, to me, that's like the gold standard of having success in the NFL. When you can gain yards on first and second down consistently, that mm -hmm. to me is the gold standard. Seattle and Kansas City did it the best this year. The full season was 54% for those two teams, early down success rate. And the Giants had a 68% <laughs> success rate on early wild. down. It is unbelievable. It was, it was a shredding. I can't even come up with a better word for it. And they, I mean, <laughs> take the, the Vikings in two games against Isaiah Hodgins had more than half of his entire receiving yard total for the entire season. They made him look, they yeah. made Isaiah Hodgins look like Randy freaking Moss. So yeah. yeah, it is going to be a massive step up in class this week against an Eagles defense that is light years, light year ahead of where the Vikings are. Jonathan Gannon's done a nice job. Yeah. This team has been solid. I criticized it earlier in the year. I didn't think they were getting enough pressure. I was wrong. they gotten just enough. Plenty of pressure. They have four players with at least 11 sacks this year. They're a little healthier off the bye. And I just I, I think the Giants offense is just – you're going to see a very different Giants offense this week. On the other side of the yeah. ball, that's where I think the volatility comes in because Jalen Hurts clearly is not 100%. He's only played now. This is going to be his second game in the last five weeks. So it's fair to question his rust factor and how sharp he's going to be. And the offensive line, I know Lane Johnson's going to play, but he still has a sports hernia that clearly has hampered him a little bit. And in the two sacks without Lane, or the two games without Lane Johnson over the last few weeks, the, the Eagles have allowed nine sacks, six of them in that game to the Saints. They really struggled in that game to the Saints. And then they allowed three, uh, three sacks in the game of the Giants when it was all backups. Now, the one positive for Philly, Aziz Ojolari injured his quad against the Vikings. He has the second most sacks on the Giants despite only playing seven games. If he can't mm. play, that's a big loss for that Giants pass rush, and it makes Jalen Hurts' job that much easier. But Hurts hasn't played great. I mean, he hasn't played great over the last few games. He was hurt, and then he didn't play great against the Giants a couple weeks ago. And Wink Martindale is going to throw a lot. He's going to throw the kitchen sink at him. And Jalen's numbers against the Blitz have been pretty good. He's got a lot of scrambles, obviously. But I don't know how he's I don't know how Jalen Hurts is gonna play this week. I think that's the that's the mystery in this game. I know the Giants mm -hmm. offense is going to struggle a little bit. They are not gonna have as easy of a time that than they did mm -hmm. last week. So it's all about can Jalen Hurts rise to the level of a MVP caliber starting quarterback in the NFL? Because the Giants defense is not good. Kirk Cousins shredded them last week. And I think if Jalen Hurts plays well, the Eagles win this game easily. But I, I don't know if he's yeah. going to play well. That's a big question mark for me. Yeah, the one thing that I know with Jalen Hurts, too, is the Eagles right now ranked 26th in expected points added per dropback during the season. Well, New York, 
their defense blitzes, blitz, blitzes, blitzes more than any other defense in the National Football League. They're blitzing on 44% of snaps. So I feel like Jalen Hurts is going to be under a lot of pressure. And the fact that they're two D, the Giants' two DBs are back as well, and he hasn't seen them yet in either game they've played so far this season, I wonder how he's going to handle that pressure with not being 100% with that shoulder injury. Something that I'll leave you guys with, the Giants are 5-0 and against the spread in their last five games, and the Eagles are 0-4 against the spread in their last four against the NFC. So something to keep one, in mind. One, one, thing, one thing I just want to reiterate, like in that first matchup where the Eagles play the Giants, they rushed for over 250 yards. There was a stint mm. during the season where the Giants were giving up, like I believe it was like over 180 yards per game consistently. So if you want to go ahead and ease your young quarterback who's coming off a shoulder injury back into the game in a division around playoffs in a game that you should win, they're going to lean heavily on the run and they're going to be able to mm. run the ball effectively with Miles Sanders and all those other guys and then have some easy passes to Goddard, some quick slants and all that stuff to A.J. Brown, and then they're going to test them over the top, and then it's going to be binkies. So I understand yeah. that we need to look at the narrative as far as, like, what happens if Jalen Hurst starts off slow and everything else. I believe Nick Sirianni learned his lesson from last year for being uh, too polarizing, whether it was, like, never, never, ever running the ball. Like, and then once they finally mm -hmm. found the run game, that's when they became successful. I think he's going to say, hey, like, we need to come out balanced. But one thing we need to do is lean on the run game, take pressure off our young quarterback, kind of gain a little bit of momentum, let him get comfortable. And then we go ahead and give him the uppercut. And I think that's what we'll see. Because that's a, that's yeah. a competitive advantage that the Eagles will have going into this game, without a doubt. I agree. I yeah, agree. the Eagles I'm have bad. the better team. It's going to be fun. I'm excited to see that one. That is our Saturday night matchup. Let's move on to Sunday, our 4 p.m. game. The game we never got to see in week 17. But we're so excited yeah. to watch is the Bengals taking on the Bills. The Bills laying five points. That total right now is ticked down a little bit to 48 and a half. Two of the best offensive teams in the NFL going head to head. Um, no one at this point really knows what to expect because we didn't see the matchup a couple weeks ago. Um, it was the highly anticipated one. And it's crazy to think that 20 days later, like 20 days ago was probably one of the most frightening moments in NFL history. And thankfully, DeMar Hamlin is okay. And he's going to be cheering on his teammates this weekend um, in Buffalo, which will be super fun to watch. It's crazy. That was only 20 days ago. Um, brought right. the whole football world together. And now we get to see these two teams go head to head. It's kind of like a surprise for what we all wanted to see back in week 17. Both teams, though, need to be much sharper this week than they were against backup quarterbacks last week. Both teams finished the regular season on an absolute tear. The Bills won eight straight. Cincy has won nine in a row. One of those streaks, my friends, is coming to an end this week. Both of these teams are legit Super Bowl contenders. I'm actually really sad that one of them is going to be done, but there can only be one winner at the end, right? The Bills have a slight edge to me. They're second in points scored and points allowed in the NFL. The Bengals rank sixth and seventh um, in the respective categories. But I still think that we're going to see a shootout between two of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. Tank, I know you love your totals. Are you taking the over 48 and a half with this one? Or because maybe the Bengals O-line's banged up a little bit, Joe Burrow's going to be under a lot more pressure with three of his O-line starters out, it goes under. How do you feel about the total? Yeah, I just wanted to scan real quick. And yeah, it's true. I thought it was the case. This will be the first time that Joe Burrow and Josh Allen actually like link up because I don't even know if we can count that last game since it ended like so abruptly, like early on in the game. Didn't count. And None of so the stats that, counted. Didn't exist. Right? And so, yeah, so that's the reason this game, I mean, that game was already so highly anticipated because going into that game, the Bengals and the Buffalo Bills are playing some of the best ball in the AFC. These mm -hmm. two, like these two quarterbacks had never faced each other. And we we're like, okay, what's going to happen? And we get the pump fake. I mean, obviously we already talked about, you know, DeMar Hamlin and that whole storyline and great to see that he's back in Buffalo healthy and everything else. But now we want to just focus between the white lines, like, like everything that we had built up into that game and for it. And now all of a sudden we just press reset, but now it stays in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. Like, this is going to be a crazy environment. And you wonder if some of the trends that we saw early on in that game before it was canceled get to pick up because, honestly, that Buffalo defense had zero answers for the Cincinnati Bengals offense. Like, Joe Burrow was mm -hmm. doing whatever the hell he wanted to early on in that game. But, yeah. but, but, like, what's happened since that game? I can't remember exactly when Lel Collins got hurt, but, like, these dudes, he, they lost, like, Lel Collins. 
before them. So he was already gone, but yeah. then they lost Kappa. And now Jonah Williams is going to mm -hmm. be out too. And it seems like, I mean, we were talking about like, okay, we can see the Cincinnati Bengals getting by the Ravens with that beat up offensive line. And that was before Jonah Williams got hurt. But we said that the injuries in the offensive line were going to eventually catch up. Will it be yeah. this week against the Buffalo Bills? But I also get paused just talking about injuries alone because we saw what the Miami Dolphins were able to do with a bunch of injuries against the Buffalo Bills. So I'm like, hmm, am I overreacting to that? And then when you go to the flip side, you have the uh, Buffalo Bills where it's like, what is really going on with Josh Allen? Like these turnovers, and not all of them are his fault. I mean, but they could just continue to happen, continue to happen. And it's one of those things where – is this why we saw the tick down in the total where now we're at 48? Because when you look at the way that game started, you expect to have a lot of points in this one, but maybe Vegas is looking at, mm -hmm. okay, Cincinnati Bengals have all these injuries along the offensive line. Buffalo Bills, Josh Allen, they haven't been able to protect the ball. And so because of those two factors, maybe that's why we're going to lean to the under. But if Josh Allen is able to resolve those turnover issues and then they get a little bit more and efficient on offense, and then the Cincinnati Bengals offense or find a way to kind of mitigate those injuries along the offensive line and do what I expect them to do is have the quick passing game, run to the strong side of the offensive line if there is one, but then also just get the ball mm -hmm. out of Joe Burrow's hands quick and try to take advantage of that Buffalo defense. Then we can potentially see some points. So I'm interested to see what Jared says, but now that the total is ticked down to 48 is this an opportunity now where you try to get in and mm -hmm. maybe try to get some exposure to the over or do you wait for it to try to get a little bit lower and then take advantage of that because ultimately I feel like both of these offenses they can catch fire and I don't want to be on the wrong side of that, and I feel like going to the under could potentially mm -hmm. be the wrong side of the total Jared, you talked about how games are won in the trenches, right? They're missing. I mean, we already talked about Lyle Collins, Alex Kappa, and now Jonah Williams goes out with a dislocated knee. I looked at last year's stats. Joe Burrow got sacked nine times in the divisional round last year. This season, when Joe Burrow is sacked five or more times, the Bengals are 0-3. When he's sacked fewer than five times, they're 13 and one. So it's going to be important for him to be protected for them to win this game. But again, who knows what that O-line is going to look like at this point and how much pressure Joe Burrow is going to be under. You think he can handle the heat? Yeah, if anyone can handle it, it's Joe Cool, right? If anyone can handle yeah. the heat. <laughs> um, Seriously, that's true. Is that even a question? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and this is coming from the person mouth. that last year tanked during the run. She bought the, what was it, Versace glasses? What were the glasses? Oh, yeah. I, but they were the fake Amazon ones, the Cartier glasses. And then I fake bought a with Joe's eyes. It's just his eyes with the sunglasses on. It says Joe Burr. <laughs> the farty so, oh, so, glasses. So I'll be she, wearing it on it was, like, it was it was Elber. Elber. Yeah. Yep. Elber. <laughs> I know. I said J B yeah. and L J B. You know what I mean? Joe Burrow and Lauren. I mean, it was El Jabur. We were all about it last year. We did the Super Bowl show together in LA and um she was all about Joe yeah. Burrow last year. I thought they were gonna win that game. Uh, that was one of the more one of the more epic Super Bowls, not only because Lauren and I were both in attendance, but just the game itself was was fascinating. So and, and we'll see if, if if Joe can replicate that. So yeah, let's let's dive into some of the some of the topics you guys kind of kind of touched on here because I think there's some there's some interesting data points surrounding all of it that make this a very mm -hmm. fascinating handicap. I, I was surprised, Tang. I agree. I, I was surprised the total drop the way that it did. It opened right around 50. And I even wrote it up on my early birds column Sunday night. I was like, both defenses didn't look great. I could see this maybe going up. Mm -hmm. But I think the offensive line injuries kind of skewed it in the other direction, and maybe it is Cincinnati. So this is what the Bengals' offensive line looks like. So Jonah Williams got hurt, left tackle. Lyle Collins was already hurt, right tackle. So both bookend tackles are both out. The guy that came in to replace Jonah Williams on Sunday, Left guard, Jackson Carmen. He's a backup left guard, had never played tackle before. Didn't grade out well. <laughs> surprise, surprise. The the <laughs> right guard, Alex Kappa, also didn't play against the Ravens. He was hurt a week or two ago. His backup, Max Sharping, had the lowest run blocking grade of any guard that played the entire weekend. <laughs> all, all the teams of wild card weekend. So there are some glaring holes on that offensive line. Now, the one caveat here is, the Ravens' defensive front, I think, is light years, maybe not light years, but I would say ahead 
of where the Bills' pass rush is without Von Miller. I, I think without yeah. Von Miller, and remember, Lauren, I said this to you, the moment he got hurt mm -hmm. and was out for the year, I said the Bills just got removed from my Super Bowl contender list because I thought – yeah. I, I don't see I don't see them being able to replicate what the Rams did last year, which was Leonard Floyd and Von Miller just wreaking havoc without Miller. And it's kind of mm -hmm. proven true. I think Matt Milano has changed my my vibe a little bit on Buffalo. He was really good on Sunday. Four pressures, two sacks. I don't think he's as good as Von Miller, but I think he can at least give you some pressure off the edge, and he's going to be a guy to keep a very close eye on this week. You had six other players on Sunday with multiple pressures. Edmonds, Johnson, Basham, Greg, Gregory Russo's, he, he's the one star. And then and Jones and Oliver are kind of kind of role players. Oliver obviously more of a run stopper. But the one thing that I think negates this is Joe Burrow's ability to adjust. And you mentioned the stat, mm -hmm. Lauren, when, when he doesn't take sacks, the Bengals win. And the reason why he hasn't taken as many sacks this year is because he's got the second shortest time to throw of any quarterback in the league behind Tom Brady. And it's not a very big gap between Brady and Burrow. I mean, they're basically 1A, 1B in terms of getting the ball mm -hmm. and getting it out fast. So I, I do think the Bengals' offense is still going to be relatively productive. Now, the one issue is yeah. they might not be able to run it because the Bills are fantastic against the run. I just mentioned Ann Oliver. And so if you take that element away – and you turn Burrow into a one-dimensional quarterback with not a lot of time to throw, can't push the ball down the field, I understand why this total dropped. And I, I think the total is probably fair right now where it's sitting underneath mm -hmm. that uh, number of 49. The, the the Josh Allen factor is is another part that Tank mentioned that I just I, I have no explanation for. Seven big-time throws, season high, seven big-time throws against the Dolphins, slinging it all over the yard. Third most – uh, turnover worthy plays in any game this year with three. So he's, mm -hmm. he's throwing it and the upside's really good, but there's a lot of downside too, with what we've seen with Josh Allen. That being said though, I think this Bengals defense is not playing as well as, as they can. So we'll see if we get an uptick in production from them. I mean, they let Tyler Huntley 52% rate, 52% success rate on dropbacks. Um, and that, that's a problem. You know, Eli Apple got toasted up got targeted five times, gave up the touchdown to Demarcus Robinson. You put Stefan yeah. Diggs on Eli Apple, and I think that's bad news bears um, for the Bengals. So I think there's a lot of elements to this game that are intriguing. I don't fully trust Josh Allen to play turnover worthy or turnover free. And how about this stat from our pal Clev T? I'll close with this. The Bengals have gone 21 straight games without losing by more than a field goal when Jamar Chase is in the lineup. So maybe wow. he's the X factor that keeps speak. all things equal. Yeah. So yeah. I would say this is a good Josh game, you know, good spot to keep it close. But I, I don't think I have a pick on a side mm -hmm. or a total here. And one nugget I wanted to add before I pass it back over to LJ is yep. this. Like one thing I noticed in that game against the Baltimore Ravens, what they were trying to do, they were using a lot of twist stunts, whether it was early in the game or especially like on third mm -hmm. down, trying to confuse – an offensive line who haven't really played together, getting them to pass off rushes, whether you have the defensive ends coming in, tackles going out, and trying to have those offensive linemen pass off the blocks. I would expect Buffalo to do the same thing. And if they're able to effectively do that, they'll get instant pressure on Joe Burrow, which kind of eliminates him having these clean looks and getting the ball out of his hands quickly. And if Love you that. can eliminate mm -hmm. that from his game, then that can give the Cincinnati Bengals offense a little bit of trouble. Yeah. So that's one thing to look out for early in this game. If you want to see a way that the Buffalo Bills could potentially remedy that quick pass game from the Buff, uh, from the Cincinnati Bengals, look and see what that uh, what that uh, Buffalo Bills defensive line is doing, especially on the early third downs mm -hmm. in that game. Yeah, that is interesting. I will say, Jared, you mentioned Josh Allen too. And literally in my notes, I had Josh Allen was sporadic last week, got away with it against mm -hmm. Miami, but the Bay Bengals defense is much better. I mean, I it look is. at a guy like Joe Burrow too, Tank. Joe Burrow is four and one in the playoffs, two and oh on the road in the playoffs, six and three on the road this year during the regular season. And he's not scared of the moment being too big. He has never lost a game in the month of January before in his entire career. He's 6-0 and in the month of January. The moment never has been too big for him when it gets to this time of the year. Another thing I looked up, I saw this on a tweet too, fourth quarter stats. Josh Allen in the fourth quarter has a 58% completion percentage, 900 yards, six touchdowns, four interceptions. Joe Burrow has a 70.2% completion percentage in the fourth quarter, over 1,000 yards, 11 touchdowns, and two interceptions. So when it gets down to late in the games, 
the numbers show that Joe Burrow is the better and more consistent quarterback in those spots. One completion percentage by 12%. Um, he has almost double okay. the amount of touchdowns in the fourth quarter. And two less interceptions in the fourth quarter. Yes, Tick. I love it. One more thing. We just got to hang on this game for one more thing. I Let's love do it. it. Listen, because you, you raise a really great point because we put so much emphasis on how these two quarterbacks are going to play. And let's just think about what both of these quarterbacks are thinking right now going into this game. Like Obviously, Joe Burrow is dealing with like the offensive line issues, but whenever you see mm -hmm. him on the podium, he's like, yo, like as long as he's I'm cool. the QB of this franchise, like we have a window, like we're in yeah. it. Yes. And it seems like nothing yeah. really phases him. What's going through Josh Allen's mind right now? Because Not it seems same. like the weight, the weight of Buffalo is on him. They've dealt with the Demar Hamlin injury. It almost feels like there's added pressure for Buffalo mm -hmm. to go out and win this game. They're playing at home. They need to win for Demar. They have to win to try to right all the wrongs from last year. And I believe Josh Allen is feeling some of that pressure. And that may be mm -hmm. part of the reason why we've seen some of these uncharacteristic turnovers. So let's see how he comes out in this game. Can he come out, play carefree, throw the ball all around the yard, and we get like this epic QB battle against Joe Burrow? Mm -hmm. Or do they create a turnover here or there early in the game and it causes him to kind of retract and we don't see that full Josh Allen? Because if we don't see Josh Allen playing with full confidence, then that could be the determining factor in this game as well. Here's how so you take the ball away from the turnovers, Tank. Just have him run the ball, right? Just have him run the ball. Like, that's how you yeah. take away, you reduce the amount of potential turnover-worthy plays by just Great point. giving and, mm -hmm. and like, it, we usually see it more in the in the more important games. I remember last year, every big game, primetime game he played in, I bet, is over rushing attempts prop just because I, I – he's just going to get more. And I don't know what the number is now. I don't even know if it's out yet, but mm -hmm. that would be an angle. That is something and to look I, at. Have, I haven't looked at all of, of what the Bengals uh, rushing quarterback defense numbers are this year either. Again, this is just kind of. But it may not matter. It does. I don't think it, it does. I, I agree. I don't yeah. think it does matter. I, I just think it takes it. That takes the pressure off too. Cause tank, you know, this, I, I don't know this because I've never played at a level higher than high school, but you take that first hit early in the game kind of loosens you up a little bit. Right. You don't want to just sit yeah. there all nice and clean in the pocket all day and wait to make those throws. Give yeah. me the ball. And we both play quarterback too, so you know it. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Give me that first hit. I'll I love run that it. gear option right at the middle. I'll take five yards and I'll take that first hit. Now I'm good. I'm loose. I'm ready to roll. Let's and go. And then just to build it. on top of what I was just mentioning before we go to the other game, we're talking about his psyche. So if he has some success with his legs, what if we notice with Josh Allen? He runs over a linebacker. Yeah. He runs over a safety. Yeah. He starts playing with more swag. And then that bleeds mm -hmm. into the passing game. So, hey, if you're looking for mm -hmm. props, that may not be a bad angle to go as well. That's a good point Love there. It. Absolutely. I know how I'm betting this game. I'm taking the points with the Bengals. I feel like this game is going to be decided by a field goal. I'm excited to see the Bengals. I'll leave you with this. 5-1-1 one one against the spread in their last seven January games. They're playing well when the moment is right. The Bills 1-5 and five against the spread in their last six games versus teams with a winning record. Something to keep in mind. Last but not least, the final game of the divisional card weekend divisional round weekend cowboys <laughs> taking on the 49ers they're kind of on a short week this week well the 49ers have two and a half basically extra days of rest um against the 49ers they're the niners are laying three and a half points in this one that total is set at 45 and a half the last time these two teams played postseason of last year the cowboys have won six of their last eight games they had a big win massive win over the bucks on monday night football dak prescott looked phenomenal despite getting a lot of hate last week from a lot of people saying nope the bucks are going to win this one. Dak Prescott proved the haters wrong. Four passing touchdowns, a rushing touchdown. Um, Brett Mayer is the one that not so much for missed extra points, but their defense held their opponent to under 20 points for the 10th time this season, which is wild. This is going to be the battle of two phenomenal defenses. And Tank, I said this to Jared this morning too. I'm excited to see Dan Quinn's defense go up against Kyle Shanahan's offense. We obviously all remember when the Falcons blew that Super Bowl 28-3, to right? That was Dan Quinn's team going up against Kyle Shanahan's offense. He was the offensive coordinator at the time. We're going to be able to see that again. And I feel like this maybe is like a chip on their shoulder game. I honestly don't know how this game's going to turn out. I'm rooting for the 49ers. I want the Brock Purdy story to happen. Like, I want to speak that into existence. But three and a half points. I feel like this game's going to be close. Who do you think comes out on top? 
This game is interesting. I remember talking about the game last week, and I wondered if Kyle Shanahan would come out with a conservative approach with Brock Purdy, given mm-hmm. that it was going to be his first playoff game. He was a rookie quarterback. He came out throwing the ball. And if you notice, like, on those first couple throws, like, Purdy was off. Like, he missed them bad. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that if you do that against the Dallas Cowboys defense, they're more than likely to make you pay. Um, but now if we want to get into the meat of the game, like, I just want to talk about a few different angles of why the Dallas Cowboys could potentially have some success in this game. Because I think everyone's going to be on the mm-hmm. San Francisco point. And I know, so let me, give it, let me go ahead and give, like, the opposite side of that narrative. In the game where the Atlanta Falcons beat the San Francisco 49ers, they had 168 rushing yards. And we can see a path to Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard having some success in the run game. Am I right? And then Mm -hmm. you also want to go and look at a narrative that's presented itself throughout the entire season against the San Francisco 49ers pass defense. If you go all the way back to week one, where Dante Pettis caught the long touchdown pass from Justin Fields in that week one upset where they beat uh, the San Francisco 49ers. That was one of the pivotal games, uh, pivotal plays in that game. We can go back to the Miami Dolphins, where they had some success with big splash plays in the game against that secondary. Then we can go back and we look at Devontae Adams' success that Jerry Stidham had in Vegas in week 17, where they had a bunch of splash plays against that 49ers secondary. I talked about all this last week going into the wild card game. And then what did we see in the wild card game? DK Metcalf had himself a game against the San Francisco 49ers secondary. Dak in that offense has finally gotten back on track. Dak and C.D. Lamb, they were like, okay, 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 against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But I can see a path to them having some explosive pass plays against that 49ers defense. So when you look at it from that perspective, like, There was all this pressure on Dak, all this hate on Dak. But I believe Dak can play well against the 49ers. Are they going to give him some pressure? Would Nick Bosa give him hell? All that's true. But I think they could have some success against that Niners defense, which makes me look at this total. And when I initially saw it at 46, my visceral reaction was like, damn, like that looks like like not enough points. Has to go over. Has to go over. I mean, if you expect the the Dallas Cowboys to at least be somewhat competent uh, on offense, then they should be able to score enough points to push this to the over. And mm-hmm. we have a feeling that the San Francisco 49ers will be able to score some points on the Dallas Cowboys defense. I think they come out and they play with their hair on fire. There's one nugget I want to point out before I throw it over to Jared. Like early on in that game on offense, I saw San Francisco line up where they had Brandon Ayuk in a tight split and then they motioned Christian McCaffrey out to like a little bunch to the opposite side of the field. So they had three wide receivers on one side one wide receiver on the other, they threw a quick slant to Brandon Ayuk. And the first thing I thought about mm-hmm. was this, hmm, whether they line up in the bunch against the Cowboys or they motion to it with another personnel, I could see them trying to sluggo, whether it's against, that's a slant and go, whether that's against Diggs or that other cornerback that's been getting his lunch eaten up on the outside. That's going to be the way that they're going to try to test that aggressive Cowboy defense because they're always aggressive against the quick game, trying to get these interceptions, trying to get game-changing plays. And I think the 49ers are going to try to take advantage of that aggressiveness that they saw against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers early. So if you see an early splash play in the past game by Brock Purdy and it's a double move, it's something that they initially planned out and they put on tape against the Seattle Seahawks. Just thinking that they may end up facing the aggressive Cowboys defense and they set the table to take advantage of it early in this upcoming game. So that's something to keep your eye out on. Jared, do you think that Mike McCarthy and the Dallas Cowboys are going to be hungry in this game after last season? Because I feel like everyone, all the Cowboy fans in the world tried to suppress what happened last year. Where Mike McCarthy definitely remembers what happens. Remember, the Cowboys had no timeouts left. And no way to stop the clock. And they still called a quarterback draw with like 14, 15 seconds left. And everyone was like, what the hell was that play call? Like, what are they doing? I feel like they could be really hungry in this one. But since week seven, these two teams have been the two highest scoring teams in the National Football League. Makes sense. 49ers got Christian McCaffrey. Cowboys had Dak return from injury. And it's also the battle of two of the best defenses in the country, too. Both rank in the top five for fewest points allowed per game during the regular season. Who has the edge in this one? Yeah, I, I think I, I like the Niners a lot. I, I'll, I'll preface it with that. I'll get my 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 pre mm-hmm. 
can see biases out of the way. I, I do like the Niners in this spot. Now I'll go through some of the points and I'll try to poke some holes because, listen, these two teams are, I think, the two best teams in the NFC, if I had to say. I think this is the real NFC championship game mm. um, taking place uh, on, on, on Sunday. So the rest advantage, I want to say it's already baked into the market based off of some of the things that I've heard from some people that I trust. Since 2007, teams with extra rest in the postseason are actually under 500 against the spread, five and six. However, all of those instances have been teams off the bye, and the spread was bigger because it makes sense. Coming off the bye, you're the one seed. You've had a better season. Odds are you're going to be favored by more than a field goal in your divisional round game. Yeah. The average spread in those 11 games was about six and a half. Eight of the 11 games had a spread larger than three and a half, which is, of course, the spread here. So it's not quite an apples to apples trend comparison, but it's fair to say that the rest advantage for San Francisco is not that important. Here's what I think is important. It's the fourth consecutive road game for Dallas, and they're traveling to across kind of across mm. the country. Not really, um, but they were in Tampa. Then they go back to Dallas, and I think they actually train in California, so they might actually be in California all week. I don't know what their travel itinerary will be, but there's still a pretty decent amount of travel going from Tampa now back to the West Coast on a short week. It was a Saturday game for the Niners. It was a Monday game for Dallas. So while it might be baked into mm -hmm. the market, I think it's still fair to say there might be a couple more nicks and cuts and bruises that won't fully yeah. heal in time for this game, whereas the Niners get the extra 48 hours. The injuries that are of big concern for me on the Dallas side is Jason Peters, their left tackle. He got hurt in the game against the Bucs. If he can't go, they will likely have to shift Tyler Smith, a rookie, out to left tackle. And I, I could see Joey, I could see the Bosa, you know, Joey and, and, and the rest of the gang there on the Niners front having a field day with that matchup. And on the other side of the ball, Jaron Curse, a uh, very, very talented safety for the mm -hmm. Cowboys, also got injured. He um, highest pro football focus tackling grade of anybody on the Cowboys roster. And he's got the 64 tackles on the year, second most on the team. So that's not a good week to be missing your best tackling safety going up against this Niners mm -hmm. offense with all the, the bells and whistles and the gadgets and gizmos that, that Kyle Shanahan can throw at you. So I definitely think those two injuries at face value, in addition to the short rest, in addition to the travel, yeah, that, that pushes me towards the Niners side a little bit. Um, but to be fair to Tank's point, the Niners defense definitely showed, a, you know, showed a little bit of weakness in the secondary 50% success rate on dropbacks by Geno Smith last week. And he, he had some moments in that game and I could see Dak absolutely having some moments in, in, in this game. I think the key is if Brock Purdy plays the way he's played through the first few weeks of his career, which was zero turnover worthy plays in his first ever playoff game. And I know it was the Seahawks defense, but it was still zero turnover worthy plays in his first postseason game. I think that first throw that you're talking about, I think there was a little moisture on the ball because that thing came out really funny and it was, it was raining nasty. early in the game. It was, it was, that was the worst throw I've seen maybe any quarterback make all year. Um, but luckily it, it bounced harmlessly in the middle of the field and it didn't, it didn't impact the game in any stretch because I think Brock from that point on really settled in after that opening drive. And we give the kid what one drive in his first playoff start to kind of sure. get through some of the numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, and he played lights out the rest of the game. And his numbers, I, we talked about this earlier in the week, LJ, the, the, the splits for him when he's facing mm -hmm. pressure compared to when he's kept clean, his turnover-worthy play rate actually goes down under duress and facing the blitz. Wow. It, it's remarkable. I mean, it's the opposite of what you would expect. Even the best quarterbacks, their numbers get worse. When And I know it's a short sample, only a handful of games, but still pretty impressive short sample against some pretty good teams, one of them being the Bucs, great defense, the other one being a road game in Seattle, tough environment on a short week, and the other one being a playoff game. The turnover-worthy plays for Brock Purdy have been basically nil, and that is impressive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think the Niners kind of run all over them, and, and, and I think Dak makes the mistake first. That, that's kind of how I see the game playing out. And if Brock makes the first mistake, then I can absolutely see Dallas winning this game. Absolutely. But I I have to trust what my numbers say, and, and they say that Dak's kind of been more of the volatile of the two quarterbacks between the two um, over the last few weeks. So uh, I'll, I'll trust it that, you know, Brock plays turnover free and the Niners get a win.
If Brock Purdy wins, he's only going to be the fifth rookie quarterback to make it to a conference title game. Can you guys name the other four? Sean King, right? Um, mm -hmm. That Rafa one. Roethlisberger. Yep. Tank got two. Yeah. There's two um, more. Um, Brady. Was he a rookie that year? One of no, one of them is still in the league right now, but he's not playing very. Well, he doesn't play at all, basically. Ooh. Nick Foles. He may or may not be in New York. Oh, Terod Taylor. No, no, Flacco. Oh, Flacco. Yeah. Was it Flacco? Oh, I thought you were talking about the yeah. Yeah, Flacco. Yeah, Flacco. One more. Yeah. Do you want me to tell you the last one? I don't know if you have No, it. give us a hint. That was fun. I like this trivia time. We used to do this last year with um, Chris Rose. Well, give us a hint. See which one of us can get it first. Is there there like a year? Is there a year he made it? A year the rookie? Um, yeah, let me let me look at what year this guy played. Because uh, I I mean, okay, so he was born in 86. Because I remember him playing in college. Um, he <laughs> born in, in 86? He played in uh, USC. Carson and Palmer? The Jets as well. And he played for the Jets as well. Oh, oh, oh Mark, Mark Sanchez. Mark Sanchez. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. Was, how could I forget that year? So Purdy will only oh. be the fifth rookie quarterback if they win to make it to a conference title and game. Flacco and Roethlisberger were the only ones who won, right? Mm -hmm. Flacco, Fra obviously. Won Fra won Flacco and Roethlisberger. Wow, say that five times fast. Fat they both won. Oh my gosh, Flacco and Roethlisberger were the only. <laughs> Can't say that five times fast. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this will be interesting to see how this game plays out. Those are the four that we have this week for the divisional round. I'm so excited. Um, Good question, we get into LJ. Teasers, Love that brain Thank teaser there. Thanks. Thank you. I got you guys. Good teamwork. You guys did that together. I think it was like two and two. Yeah. That was awesome. It was. Um, Impressive. All right, before we get into job, Jared's Hank. teaser for a divisional weekend, mm. <laughs> do we have any good props for this weekend that you guys are looking at? Or are we staying away from props at this point? Kelsey. Go, Kelsey. And I'll give you another one that I don't know if this one's going to have an impact. But Boston Scott has scored 17 touchdowns in his entire career. Ten of them have come against the Giants. I don't know if mm. he's going to play a lot this week because it's, you know, Sanders and they've got so many other guys. But Boston Scott is like a touchdown machine against the Giants. It's like, I don't know what it is, but he just scores a lot against them. He scored against them in week 18, too. I was on it at 3-1. to one. one of my buddies tipped me off to it. And I'm like, oh, yeah, wow, I forgot. He's got this crazy touchdown streak against the Giants. So. I would say Travis Kelsey over receiving yards. I would say Boston Scott touchdown sprinkle. I don't know, Tank. What do you think? Maybe some Mahomes yeah. action if you don't want to go Kelsey. You just want to put it all I mean, on Mahomes' like, shoulder. Like you always talk about that you have to pay like this Mahomes tax. And I would assume that yeah. once the props open that you'll probably have mm -hmm. that tax on the props as well. I mean, so I think it's some things up. that I would look out for is um, – Pacheco rushing yards. I know Clyde Edwards Hilaire, like he's practicing, but I don't know if he's yeah. going to play. And Pacheco could have a decent running game against the Jacksonville Jaguars. So that's interesting to me. I think Travis Etienne on the flip side, his rushing prop, especially if it isn't too high, that's <laughs> something to look at along with Evan Ingram. I think a, a Jalen Hurts anytime touchdown prop is interesting because they don't want to turn the ball over in yeah. the red zone. And so that could be a layup for him using his legs to get into the end zone. I also like a Dallas Goddard receiving prop because of the success that mm -hmm. TJ Hawkinson had against the Giants. Those two games, it seems like if the if, if the Dallas Goddard prop isn't too crazy and inflated, that should be a great play for you as well. And in the Josh Allen, I like it. Makes it I think I think all the yeah, absolutely. Josh props Allen, have value yeah, in sure. the postseason, right? Like I I, I think because the market just takes what their rushing totals were from the regular season, mm -hmm. spits out a number. Like Tank said, the Mahomes tax, you're not getting a fair number on Mahomes, but I think you are getting a fair number on the quarterback rushing props because during the postseason, there's not that conservative, I'm trying to save myself for the postseason. I don't want to run and put my head down and get that extra yard. In the playoffs, screw it. Head down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go after it. And one more thing, too. If you look at the Cowboys and Niners wide receivers, just because the 49ers defense is known for giving up those splash plays, you have a uh, Trayvon Diggs that gets a little bit too aggressive, and then the other cornerback gets toast all the time. Look for the longest reception for some of those wide receivers, like whether it's Brandon Ayuk, Brandon Ayuk Debo Ayuk Samuel, C.D. Lamb, balling. some of those guys. Like, I would probably pick one of the wide receivers who's going to get some of those downfield targets that has, like, that re oh, 
long reception and like that 21 to 23, 24 ish range, and then just go over that because mm -hmm. I think we'll have some splash, some splash plays in the passing game in this one. Brandon Ayuk had one of yeah. the quietest thousand yard receiving seasons, I think, in the history of the yeah. NFL. Like, we don't, we don't even talk about him. Like, he is like a complete afterthought in that offense, but he had a thousand yard receiving season. Yeah. It's crazy. It really is. This weekend is going to be so much fun, you guys. Four games, eight teams. It all comes down to the divisional round to move on to the conference team next or conference round next weekend. Teaser time, Jared. Who do we got for our divisional round teasers? I already locked it in. Um, it's a two-unit teaser. It will be in the uh, best bets column that will air or that will air that will drop uh, no probably air. Thursday. It will just throw it out in the air. Um, <laughs> probably Thursday night, Friday morning. But you guys get it first. Playbook had it first. Uh, it's the Bengals up from five and a half to eleven and a half. And again, that's not a traditional teaser move, but. Our options are limited this week, and I don't love teasing the Chiefs down because I think, first of all, maybe the Jags are alive. No, maybe not. But that total is the highest total of the whole weekend. So, again, you're not getting as much value with your six-point move than you are in this Bengals-Bills game where the total is dropping. So the points are a little more valuable. And, again, Cincinnati through six, seven, and ten. Those are all secondary key numbers. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good spot for them to keep it close. And then the Eagles, I, I think at home, they're going to take care of business. And I like getting that down to one and a half. So there you go. One and a half on Philly and uh, close game, hopefully, between Cincinnati and Buffalo. Don't really care who wins. Just keep it within 11, please, the Bengals. I like it. Uh, let's bet it. Presented by our friends at Superbook Sports. Make sure you go to Superbook.com or download the app today. And this season, guys, we are all rooting for safeties. That if you get Superbook, will give you a $50 bonus on each safety scored this season. Just place a $100 per game bet on any spread or any total. And if there's a safety scored in any game on Sunday, you, my friends, get a $50 bonus. Make sure to visit Superbook.com for terms and conditions. All right. Best bet time, Tank. Who you got from the four games we talked about is your best bet of the divisional round weekend. Uh, as Jared and I were kind of talking about before we hopped on the show, I mean, I think a lot of times when you see props and lines that are really good, the sharps just bet them up really quick. I think that's one thing mm -hmm. we saw. Like I was kind of recommending Jacksonville at Kansas City. It was started at 51 and a half. That's when I saw it. And then it already jumped up to 53. I really like the over in Dallas at San Francisco at 46. I, I believe we'll have some points in this game. But I think if you're trying to find some more strategic bets where you can get more value, then look at some of these props right where they open. Some of the props that we threw out, mm -hmm. whether it's like the Dallas Goddard, the Travis Kelsey, like just continue to kind of keep these sites open as soon as they open. If you see something that you like that looks good, hop on it quick. And then you'll probably okay. see that those numbers are going to jump almost immediately because the sharps are going to be on it. So I think that's the best way to get your value. Now that these lines and these spreads have been out here for a while, like go ahead and wait for the props, try to hop on those quick and then have like this narrative in your head about how you think a game is going to play out. And say, for example, if you start to get some movement back towards the 51 and a half or something like that in that Kansas City Jacksonville game, then maybe you mm -hmm. get in on the over of that. And so I think that'll probably be the mm -hmm. best way to play it. I agree. I like it. Jared, how about you? Divisional round, best bet. Yeah, I'll give you the Niners um, laying three and a half. And I think it's, it's the shortest spread of the weekend. So this should be the best game of the weekend, at least according to what the odds makers think. But I, I also think this game has a chance to be a blowout if our, our, our guy, Brock Lobster, who is now becoming the story <laughs> of the first season, um, if he is able to, he doesn't even have to outplay Dak Prescott. He just has to make fewer mistakes. He doesn't have to have the flashy throws. Like, like Dak made a lot of really nice throws, and he made a really nice a lot, a lot of really nice reads. I think Brock just has to not screw the pooch. And, and I think the Niners defensively are gonna are gonna be able to do what they do best, which is the half of the pass and put pressure. And put, I'll tell you who screwed the pooch last week: the Vikings defense. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> that pooch was screwed yeah. six ways from Sunday. Um, but. If as as long as Dak is, is is himself and plays to the numbers that I've seen this year, which is he's going to make some mistakes, and I was actually surprised that Tampa Bay was unable to turn him over in a significant spot uh, in that game on Monday night. He was very efficient managing the offense. 
I don't know if he can string two consecutive games like that together on the road against two good defenses. I give a lot of credit. I thought the Bucs defense played okay until the second half when things just kind of got out of hand a little bit. And Dak made mm-hmm. a couple of really nice plays on fourth down and some really nice reads. So we'll see what the Niners defense does. We'll see if Jason Peters is healthy. But to me, this game comes down to our pal Brock Purdy. If he plays to the numbers that I'm looking at right now, which is under pressure, turnover-worthy play percentage, dropped. Against the Blitz, all of those things drop. His, his big-time throw rate actually goes up when under pressure this year. And I think it's a Debo, Samuel kind of game. In fact, I wouldn't be opposed to anyone wanting to bet Debo in the Super Bowl MVP market uh, this week because I think mm. if the Niners win this game, I think they will now be the de facto Super Bowl favorites because I think they'd be a ro- I think they're going to be a road favorite in Philly next week if that's the matchup that we get based off the numbers that I'm looking at. So again, this is kind of the last big test for um, for uh, this uh, Niners team. I, I think they'll be favored on the road next week against Philly, and I think they'd win that game too. I think this is the real NFC Championship game taking place uh, a Sunday in San Francisco. So I will lay it with the Niners, and I'll hope that our guy Brock Lobster does his thing and Dak commits a couple turnovers, and uh, and we're seeing the Niners uh, you know, move on to the NFC Championship game. Yeah, I like it. And I said my best bet, too. It's the Bengals and the points. Getting the five points with the Cincinnati Bengals. Um, Joe Burrow, the moment's never too big for him. He's 4-1 and in the playoffs, 2-0 and on the road in the playoffs, 6-3 and on the road this year during the regular season. He's never lost in the month of January before. He's 6-0 and wow. in his career in the month of January. I feel like this game's going to be decided by a field goal. It is two of the best quarterbacks going up against each other right now. I give the edge to... Joe Burrow just and I and I look at their their fourth quarter stats too. I said that Joe Burrow in the fourth quarter, seventy over seventy percent completion percentage, over a thousand yards, eleven touchdowns, two interceptions for Josh Allen um, as a fifty eight percent completion percentage in the fourth quarter, nine hundred yards, six touchdowns, four interceptions. The numbers favor Joe Burrow late in the games. Also, the Bengals are five one and one against the spread in their last seven January games, and the Bills one and five against the spread in their last six against teams with a winning record. I feel like the Bengals are going to take advantage here. I don't know who's going to win this game, but I feel like this game's going to be decided by a field goal. Um, and that comes down five points. Too much. Love it. Let's get into it, guys. That's it for us. Um, you can find us on YouTube, on Twitter. Make sure to check out everything that is picks wise for the divisional round weekend. That's Tank Williams. That's Jared Smith. I'm Lauren Jabara. We'll see you next weekend for championship weekend. And then there were four. But until then, enjoy this one. We'll see you guys. Peace.